One of the most important maker skills is to know how to interface humans with a project. What we mean by this is how do we get a human to send data to a project to control it and then get the project to send data back to a human? Well, there are countless ways to do this, some good, some bad. Sometimes a simple button with an LED is appropriate for your project, but there is usually a way to make it look and feel a lot nicer, and maybe even make it feel more like a finished professional product. All right, here's the deal. You sit back and watch as we tell you some of the best ways to interface with your project and how to make them good. We aren't going to go over how to wire up all of these things, but on the course page link below, you'll find a link to a getting started guide on pretty much everything you see in this video. If you don't already know, this video is a part of a workshop where Liam and myself will take you through a fast paced and practical journey to learn a wide variety of maker skills so that you have the tools and knowledge to make anything. It's a part of Fab Academy. We're going to build our own projects and share the insights along the way with you. Let's start with getting information from a human to a project. And the simplest one of them all is a button. Buttons are cheap, easy to use and often small. They can be set on and off and are great for when you need to turn something on or off. We're not gonna labor on the point, everyone knows about buttons. But they're also great at changing a value like a temperature on a soldering iron. Just don't break a cardinal sin here and ensure that you program it so that if you hold the button, it rapidly moves through these values. As always, when using a button, you'll need pull up or pull down resistors. Most microcontrollers have have inbuilt ones you can use nowadays. You'll also want to implement some debounce and it's always a good idea to use buttons with interrupts. It makes them incredibly responsive and it's how you should be using buttons in your project. You can also find capacitive touch buttons which don't use a clicky mechanism but the capacitance of your body. These are really cool and you can get creative with them. Our Fab Lab instructor Claire attached some conductive thread to one and her project could sense when somebody was hugging it because it was activating the button. Buttons are great but what if you have a large range of values that you want to cycle through? This is where potentiometers and encoders may be a better option. That nice rotational motion lets you move across large values really quickly. And we have some options here. Potentiometers are great. They return a voltage that corresponds to what angle they're at, but they have limited rotation. And that's a good way to think of these. They are kind of like an angle sensor. They can also come in these linear sliding versions, which are also really cool. Another option are rotary encoders, which as they spin return clicks or pulses that you can use to know how much they've rotated. You'll often find these in your car stereo, for example. The best thing about these is that they can rotate infinitely. Whilst a potentiometer is an angle sensor, these are more so a rotation sensor. They measure how much you are rotating it. It's a subtle yet important difference here. If you're using a potentiometer or an encoder and you have a large range you need to go through, but also you need to precisely set a number in that range, using a coarse and a fine control knob combo like on a power supply is a really good idea. One moves the value by really large steps and the other moves it by very small steps to get a very precise value. You can also find knobs with an inbuilt button. And this is a super handy tool for navigating through menus in a project. An extension of these are joysticks, which are often just two potentiometers put together. They're great for when you have two values that you need to change at once, like driving a robot around. One might control the forward speed and one might control the turning speed. Some quick tips on these. Taller sticks are sometimes a bit awkward to use, but you'll have a lot better control over it. Dead zones are also important to implement because joysticks will never have a perfect centered position and a dead zone will prevent any drifting from happening here. And if you're a maker who deals with robots a lot, an RC transceiver setup might be worth the investment. My robotics project Leo will eventually get one of these set up with him. An upgrade to the button comes in the form of force sensors, things like load cells, force sensitive resistors, and velostat. These are not only able to detect that a human has pressed them, but how hard did someone press them? They return an analog voltage like a potentiometer. A great example of these in use are in launch pads, which might make a louder sound depending on how hard you tap that button. You can also go larger scale, as in scales. The scales that you use to weigh yourself are often load cells, and you can do some cool things with them, like putting them under a doormat to detect if someone is there, literally like a Minecraft pressure plate. These are sometimes a bit niche of a human input because we're not often good at applying exact amounts of force to something. We're often better suited to turning knobs and pressing buttons really rapidly. In all of these methods so far, we have moved our body somewhere to interact with hardware. But what if we cut out the middleman and measured the movement of our body directly? Well, there's lots of ways to do this. You could strap an IMU sensor to yourself somewhere and that tracks the movement, rotation, angle, whatever you need so you can get some gesture control into your project. 
You can also get gesture control modules, which allow you to swipe and move your hand around in mid-air to control your project. They can be a little bit clunky sometimes, but they're a great option for no-touch interaction, like if you had wet hands or paint-covered hands. You can also go one step further and get EMG sensors, which you attach to your body, and it measures your flexing of muscles and turns that into a signal. They do have their own problems, but they are super cool and worth knowing about. Even cooler are EEG sensors sensors, which measure your brain waves. It's usually something you put on your head and it non-invasively measures your brain activity. They do vary in levels of performance here and there, but it's now reasonably affordable to buy a sensor that measures your brain waves and thinking strength, if you know what I mean. We also have other forms of interaction than movement. How about sound. The lowest level of this is an inexpensive loudness sensor and it just reads how loud a room is and you can do things like control lights with a clap. Can you turn that back on? Yeah. No worries. All good Chief. Thank you. That one didn't turn on. <laughs> Thank you. All right, sweet. They usually don't have... <laughs> A step up from this, you can get dedicated hardware modules for voice recognition. They usually don't have every word in the English dictionary, but they tend to have a set list of keywords that you can command to it, like open, stop, off, up, things like that. And if you want to take this to the next level, small computers like a Raspberry Pi can be set up for voice recognition and speech to text. If you are going to the extent of using a Raspberry Pi, machine vision is also a very achievable option nowadays. It may seem a little bit complex, but setting up a Raspberry Pi and a camera to detect your facial expressions or recognize objects or track the pose of your body is actually a really straightforward and easy process. Those are just some of the ways to send data from a human to a project, but now let's look at some ways to do that in reverse. Again, simple to more advanced, starting with vibrational motors. Really straightforward, exactly like your cell phone or controller, you can vibrate patterns or error codes or whatever you really want, and this is a great option for a project that is designed to be held by a human. If we instead vibrate the air, we get noise. Cheap buzzer modules are great, and in a similar manner, you can beep error codes or confirmation beeps or whatever you need. And a step up from this are speakers, which are quite easy to add to microcontrollers nowadays. But possibly the most effective output we humans can process is something visual. The most basic output is an LED. Flash it, change its brightness, get an RGB one and change its color. There are a lot of creative ways to output data from your project. They're cheap, they're easy, and they can be driven with low spec hardware. If we put a lot of LEDs together and make it a bit more information efficient, we can get a segmented LED display. Just like your alarm clock, these are a fantastic way to show number readouts. And you can also get these 1602 displays that have some more segments in them, and they're well suited for displaying letters and numbers. Moving into the world of pixels, you can get lots of different displays for both microcontrollers like the Pico and Arduino, and single board computers like the Raspberry Pi. These little OLED screens are some of my favorite things on this earth. They are an awesome little black and white display, really easy to use and low power. You can write text on it, draw lines, boxes and circles to make your own UI. Whatever you need to do, if it can be black and white and on 128 by 64 pixels, this bad boy has got you. Another cool option are e-ink displays. They have pixels, but instead of lighting up different colors, they change the color of the ink in the pixels. These have a nice paper light -like look to them and they can show an image even without power. You do need power to update the image though. This one has been sitting unplugged for about two years now and it still has its image nice and clear. One of the biggest downsides is that they do take a few seconds to update the image, so they aren't good if you need real time or live data, but they're really good low powered device and small ones are really great for embedding in just about any project. Touchscreens can seem a little bit scary for beginners, but they're really easy to use and most of the time they're just plug and play. You can get simple screens for microcontrollers and high resolution screens for a Raspberry Pi. If I were to add a touchscreen to my project though, I would rather it on a computer and not a microcontroller and a Pi Zero might be a great inexpensive option to drive a touchscreen display. Touchscreens can just be so damn information rich and it's also really easy to build your own app 
apps and interfaces for it. TK Inter comes standard with Python nowadays and is a really easy tool to make simple UI with. I actually use TK Inter on my robot Leo to build an interface to let me test the motors easily. TK Inter can look a little outdated sometimes, they're a little early 2000s, and there are nicer frameworks out there to build your own interfaces, things like PyQt and Flask. And you don't need to be a coding or UI wizard to make an interface with it. Large language models like ChatGPT are usually pretty well versed in these and you can just describe to it what you want and it will be able to code it up for you. One final tip, you probably already have a touchscreen readily available. If you have a wireless microcontroller like an ESP32 or a Pico W or even a Raspberry Pi, you can host a web page interface through Wi-Fi and then connect to it with your phone. This is actually way easier than it sounds and on our mid-semester project, which was an esky on wheels, this is actually how we remotely controlled it. It was the most cost effective and no extra hardware required solution. Well, as much as I'd like to waffle on about interface devices, it's going to start getting more and more niche from here. This list is far from comprehensive and there will be many more creative applications of different hardware out there to allow you to interface with your project. Again, you'll find a link below to the course page where we'll have some resources to get you started with everything we talked about in this video. Till next time. Happy making.